Welcome to another edition of Florida Sportsman Action Spotter Podcast. Hey, we're going to do things a little different tonight. I want to focus on two people, and there's a reason for that. We're not going to talk about what's going on in our country. In fact, in the whole world, everybody knows that. But what I want to know is what's going on with our fisheries. Who better to ask than Dr. Ellen Peel from the Billfish Foundation? Dr. Peel keeps up with all the population numbers, and I want to know what our billfish populations have been like since we took the pelagic longlines out of the Straits of Florida 20 years ago. Then I want to talk with Captain Ray Rocher. He spent more time on the water than anybody in the last 20 years of Florida, and I want to know what he sees. What are the catches like? What species are doing well? What species are still struggling? It's going to be an interesting conversation, so sit back, relax, and get ready for another edition of Florida Sportsman action spotter podcast florida sportsman podcast is brought to you by yamaha reliability starts here by tournament master chum the finest chum on earth by nasara paradise rentals your dream vacation and by young boats you want the finest in flats bay and offshore hybrid boats you want to visit youngboats.com I want to go hear it from the doctor herself. Ellen Peel's been at the head of the Billfish Foundation for, gosh, as long as I can remember now, and she is a passionate conservationist. And I really want to know from her what's going on with our blue water pelagic population since we took the long lines out of the EEZ. Ellen, are you with us? I am, Rick. It's so good to be with you and the listeners and looking forward to listening to Ray's interview as well. Yep, Ray's, Ray's going to be right up behind you. I'm dying to know now, how long has it been since the long lines came out? Well, they were removed from the east coast of Florida and off of Charleston 19 years ago, soon to be 20, and in the Gulf of Mexico 20 years ago. And the reason for those waters being closed to that gear was that the species, juvenile swordfish, blue marlin, white marlin, sailfish, marine mammals, sea turtles, some tunas and some sharks, were already being overfished by pelagic longline gear. The focus at that time was primarily on juvenile swordfish. So the waters were closed in hopes that we would start seeing some regrowth. Certainly with some we have. The sailfish, we've not had a stock assessment recently. White marlin and blue marlin, unfortunately, are still quite overfished, but we don't see any further decline. Now, because the waters were closed, to protect overfished species, we would think that the National Marine Fishery Service, who has management authority, would leave the water closed until those species recover, or at least most of them. The only species within those waters that has recovered is swordfish, which is a wonderful achievement. However, there's no need in putting the gear back in the water to overfish them again and at the same time, further hamper the recovery of so many other species. With species comes the economic and support of sport fishing conservation and all the related businesses. So we are continuously striving to convince the agency and higher up that it is a nonsensical move to open up the zone. Listen to this. This is what's so confounding. The rationale by the federal government is they want to open it for research, long line research, so the long line boat can catch swordfish, kill them, and sell them to prove that closing those waters made sense. <laughs> Ellen, now, that can only be a government program. Okay, there's nowhere, yeah. there's nowhere else on earth that that could make sense. Right, it's like starting telling, convincing someone to start a savings account. And certain amount grow each month, and you put more and more in. And at the end of 19 or 20 years, you say, gee, why don't we see if that did any good? Go in and spend all that money, and we'll see if that was an effective means of increasing your financial ability. So it makes no sense. It's only to try to accommodate a few longline vessels. We now authorize buoy gear on the East Coast, which is a much more selective and clean fishery which it can still fish in those waters, and we're hoping that the government will realize buoy gear is one option to pelagic longline gear. It's a much better option, Ellen. It clearly is, and I don't see where the argument could even come from. 
I was blessed enough. I'm an old man, as you know, and I fished back in 79 and 78 when Jesse Webb and Al Fluger started that whole thing and it caught fire and went up the East Coast and the sword fishing was fantastic and then came here to Longline Boats. Listen, I've seen the best of it and I think I know I've seen the worst of it and gosh, I got to tell you, they're back. They're doing really well. Nick Stanzik gives us a weekly Action Spotter podcast. He just finished 19 days in a row of catching swordfish, daytime swordfish, right there out of uh, Ala Mirada. And then he missed a day, and now he's back on a five-day stretch again. So our sword fishing right now is very good. Just leave it alone. Oh, it's fantastic. The Department of Commerce, they are concerned that there's so many swordfish imported into the United States. Well, that is unfortunate. But if every swordfish that was within those closed waters or that swam within those were landed and exported, unfortunately, that would not make up our trade deficit on swordfish. It's just not realistic. It's much better to support the abundance of the stock with an industry that generates more economic return to coastal communities and jobs. Now, you mentioned that you haven't seen the recovery in sailfish, white marlin, and blue marlin yet. Is that because of lack of study? We haven't had a population study of it? Or have they just not seemed to recover like we hoped they would? You know, I had the benefit of working with some scientists. And if you think, you know, uh, I look at the coronavirus, you know, and the predictions and the models, and we all remember that on hurricane projections. Well, the real frustrating fact is estimating abundance of highly migratory fish is based on what catch and landed data the countries have. They all many come together and they look at how many were landed, let's say, 10 years ago versus how many are landed today. And they come up with a relative abundance. Now, if this were a commercial fishery where you had lots and lots of dead fish, you can count and come up with a much more accurate assessment of abundance. But the lack of data, it is the biggest frustration. No nation puts serious emphasis on billfish. The U.S. puts the most. But we need more tagging data. This surprises a lot of anglers. It's actually the recapture data that's the most valuable. And we need to get thousands of more tags out on all the billfish species, particularly white marlin and blue marlin, so that the recapture rate increases and it gives the scientists a more refined data point with which to work. So the next assessment for marlin will be in about four years. Sailfish, it's unfortunate, I want to say bless their hearts and some from the south, because they are the lowest priority, well, and spearfish within the highly migratory species. I see. That's interesting. I, it's extremely frustrating. To me, anecdotally, it looks like at least white marlin are doing better. I think you're right there, but like you said, it's anecdotal. We don't know, but until we can get some more recapture data out there. However, even before the science, the long as anglers are enjoying a higher hookup rate that's very encouraging the data is always a minimum of two years behind those of you on the water see responses by the species before it ever gets into data and ever gets cranked up by the scientists so i think you're right increased interaction with white marlin by anglers is a good indication that we should see some improvement in stuff when the next assessment is done now, let me ask you a question that's always bothered me. Now, what percentage of sailfish that get tagged over the years get recaptured? Well, had you sent me that, I would have had that answer from... <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, that's all right. No, no, we have that readily available. Higher, certainly, with sailfish than with the other species, and many of them are still within the area where they were tagged. It's Certainly not as high as you might think, but we do know some are captured, you know, by commercial vessels and they aren't calling in. Though years ago they did, and you know, to tell us on any recapture. A larger percent, but certainly probably no more than 10%. That's high. The average recapture rate on any tagging program is about 1%, and TDF ours is up, you know, above 2 which that's something to get real excited about, ladies and gentlemen. Well, here's what bothers me, though. If we see yeah. a high ratio of return, 
Like here in, in our inland waters in Jacksonville, they've started a redfish tagging program. They're seeing a very high rate of return. Well, that tells okay. me that we're fishing on a very finite population of fish. You're if, absolutely right. Isn't a bad return actually a better <laughs> sign for the population than a, than a high return? You are right. You want to have enough returns where the scientists get a understanding of the relative abundance. Yes, if we were tagging 1,500 sailfish a year and recapturing 1,300, you know, the next year, 1,300, <laughs> yes, that, that gives us plenty of reason for concern. The rate is higher than the other species, but it's nowhere near what you're probably seeing up there off of Jacksonville with the other species. Just to guess, I would guess that we see so many sailfish because they generally stay within our territorial waters, don't they? They're not usually open ocean. They're, they're right. They right. So they stay pretty much on the higher side of the continental shelf. Yeah, they're much more coastal in nature. They you know, find a good place and hang out. Yeah, you know, marlin are much more, particularly blues and blacks, you know, much more migratory, long-distance runners than the other two. So let me say, in terms of these threats to our listeners, to please stay in contact with TGF on our website at the bottom of the home page is a free option where anyone can go on and they have to put in their own email. They won't let us put it in. But for a monthly e-news, which brings you up to date on what's happening, because of the virus, the National Marine Fisheries Service is holding off on some action. Having said that, they just issued their final decision on restricted areas to longline gear. Those are much smaller. Don't get confused. Those are not closed up. The one off of Haddis is opened up. The one off in of New Jersey and in the Gulf of Mexico will remain closed. Okay. Long line monitoring area. Now, we'll see how much data comes in. But those aren't nearly as threatening as the big closed zones on the East Coast and in the Gulf of Mexico. I'd like anglers to stay tuned. Depending on what we see from the agencies, I may need some real grassroots efforts particularly directed at Capitol Hill and higher, not, you know, the agency. They changed their whole process because anglers did a fabulous job in supporting us and expressing their opposition. The first two times National Marine Fisheries Service started to open those zones. Well, I hope that we have learned from the Red Snapper debacle that we better get involved in what's happening with our fisheries before it goes into somebody else's hands and no longer makes any sense at all. I'm so glad you said that, because if I said they go, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Believe me, the agency look at issues and, you know, assess, is this really important to anyone, or is it just Ellen and TBF jumping up and down? When I really need more voices behind me and letters, so please, please stay tuned. I need your help. You've given it in the past. But we're now up in the serious realm of persuasion because the agency has changed their strategy from one that would allow public input, which we did for two years and we got them to back off, to now a strategy under a, quote, overarching research plan, which allows them to go, when someone wants to go in the closed zone, and goes, oh, I think this meets the scientific parameters. They're approved. Mm. And no public comment is given for that, and that's just not fair. And rightfully so, the virus situation has changed all of our lives. I just hope the National Marine Fisheries Service realizes now is not the time to come out with major bad decisions. If anything, they should be supporting sport fishing. And to that point, I did get an email this weekend from the agency saying they're putting together a commercial fishery and recreational fishery committee to assess impact caused to both industries from the virus. I'm hoping that might be an indication that some of the federal money might be coming available if someone has an offshore HMS vessel permit. Mm -hmm. I hear the state of Florida's unemployment compensation has gone from $200 a week to $600 a week. And I know some captains and mates have already taken advantage of it. So don't overlook that resource. File for that, and then let's see if we can get some more news from the federal. Maybe there'll be some federal funds to augment that. I hope so, Ellen, because I know dozens of dozens of charter boat captains, and they've just really taken one in the teeth. I mean, they, yep. gee whiz. I mean, depending on 
what little bit of local business, uh, you know, a place like Alamorada has. Alamorada has no local customers. Everybody right. that comes there is a, is a visitor. And now that's just poor Captain Nick Stanzik. He's just shut down. You know, he, I mean, that's it's a, just, it's a bad, bad situation. Oh, it is. And, you know, those folks, they're not taking 50 people. They're not taking even 10. It's a shame there isn't some evaluation looking at you know, the size boat. Maybe they want to limit the numbers, but we know with crew and guests, usually the number is relatively small. But they certainly just clamp down. And we want everyone to stay healthy. Goodness knows, yes. But at the same time, it would be great if some of these could continue to operate. Okay, what I need you to do is tell me how guys can get involved in stopping the National Marine Fisheries Service from allowing the long lines back into the EEZ, which has got to be on my top 10 list of things I never want to see happen. Amen. Two things. Number one, please sign up for the free monthly e-news on the Billfish Foundation's homepage. It's at the bottom of the page on the right side. Second, let me share my email address. It's Ellen, E-L-L-E-N, underscore, Peel, that's P. E-E-L, at billfish.org. That's Please it. Please let me know if you're interested. Once I see the ugly dragon's head rising again, we need to go after him and try to cut that off. Certainly, if you have, I mean, meaningful contact on Capitol Hill, or you are a company or have a company that has a lobbying firm, we're at this level, that can be the most helpful. So I would love to hear from you. Perfect. Perfect. Ellen, I can't thank you enough. It sounds to me like if we can keep the long lines out of the EEZ, we're going to be all right for a while. I think you're absolutely right. It's such a pleasure to have the opportunity to talk with you and your listeners. And everyone, great help. And I hope we get everything back fishing soon. Don't forget the unemployment compensation. Please go on TBS website and sign up. I'm looking forward to working with each of you. Dr. Ellen Peel from the Billfish Foundation. Thank you so much, Ellen. Hey, thank you, Rick. My pleasure. Talk to you soon. Tonight's special edition of Florida Sportsman Action Spotter Podcast is brought to you by Yamaha. Reliability starts here. By Tournament Master Chum, the best chum on earth. By Nasara Paradise Rentals, your dream vacation. And by Young Boats. You want the finest in Flats Bay and offshore hybrid boats? You want to visit youngboats.com. You know what Yamaha outboards love? The genuine formula and consistency of Yamalu marine engine oils. Blood, 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 blood. Outboards are subjected to punishing conditions like high loads, salt, and humidity, a mix that automotive oils can't handle. Yamalu full synthetic and marine performance formulas are certified to protect against friction and corrosion for reliable performance every time. Ah. Find Yamalu marine oils at your nearest Yamaha outboard dealer. Locate them at yamahaoutboards.com backslash dealers. Yamaha. Reliability starts here. Hey, Raj, you know, being consistent is a mark of a quality product. If you've been Florida's number one chum for over 10 years, there's got to be a reason. For 10 years, Tournament Master Chum has lived up to his name. That's why more tournament pros insist on Tournament Master than any other chum. It's the only chum with Menhaden milk mixed right in. That means it gets a scent out faster and deeper than any other brand of chum. It comes in a grind size for every species from kingfish to catch and bait. Your fishing time is way too precious to use second-rate chum. Bring the action to you by insisting on Tournament Master Chum. It's worth every penny. When you're ready for the finest in custom-made flat spay or inshore-offshore hybrids, you are ready to meet the Young family in Inglis, Florida. For over 21 years, the Young family has built custom boats for every type of fishing. Nothing can sneak up on a flat quite like the Gulf Shore flats boats, and I've never fished a better hybrid than the Young 24s and 27s. Rob Young is a naval architect who takes tremendous pride in each and every build. Is it time for you to move up? Are you ready to own the finest boat built? Then you need to visit the Young Boat Facility in Inglis, Florida, or check them out online at youngboats.com. Our thanks to Ellen Peel, the head of the Billfish Foundation. I tell you what, there's a lot of good news with the longliners being gone. The sailfish have certainly come back. No doubt the swordfish have come back. We learn that on a weekly basis from our friend Nick Stanzik. And a lot of fish are in better shape since they came out. And Ellen's worried that longlines are talking about coming back into the fleet. The National Marine Fisheries Service is considering allowing longlining in the EEZ again, supposedly in the name of research. She's not buying that. 
But I want to get the view from the water. I want to talk to the man himself who may spend more time offshore than anybody I know, and certainly at a skill level we all dream to achieve someday. Captain Ray Rocher. Captain Ray, how are you? I'm good, Rick. How are you? I'm doing fine. I'm so tickled to talk to you tonight. There's some questions I've got for you. Do you feel like our bill fishing, um, I guess sailfish is the number one target for all of us here in Florida. Do you feel like it's gotten better since we took the long lines out? It's only gotten better. Last season was a little slower than the year before, but it does cycle. There are good years and bad years. And it's funny this year, we haven't had great sail fishing this whole season. We haven't seen, you know, really giant days. A few double digit days, but not a lot. And it was only under really optimal conditions, you know, with a really top shelf team loaded with bait good sunlight and here they are but it has not been a year where you know a lot of boats have great days until recently and i hate to tell you but some of the boats that have gotten out in recent weeks have done really well there aren't many boats fishing you know the fwc has allowed some recreational activity in small groups and it's just killing my soul that we've had the windiest winter i can remember and now with everything that's going on we've had the calmest weather <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Now it gets calm. Now it gets calm. Thanks a lot. Yeah. Really? But <laughs> the numbers neatly have been really good. The few boats have gotten out of really done well. But really, I mean, I hate to, I'm not trying to torture everybody, but the bottom line is the fishing is turning on, and hopefully in, in the not so distant future, we'll all be able to get back out there and enjoy it. Ram, I'm going to give you something that I think is, is really good news when it comes to sailfish. And that is that I caught a double header on my boat the other day. Now, what's unusual about that is it's always been too cold to catch them in Jacksonville in March. I mean, that just didn't happen. You know, but the last two years, those fish have wintered here, and we've seen a lot more of them up here. So I think the numbers are good. I just don't think you get to hog them all to yourself because it hadn't been a cold enough winter. You're upset about that. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like but, to go back to the old days. But no, 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 no. I like the warmer weather up here so we can catch them too. But I think we both agree that sailfish numbers are in pretty good shape. What about the other fish that we fish for, the tuna, mahi, and dolphin? Well, the dolphins are very cyclical. And when I was young, I talked to old captains, and they told me there were good years and bad years before either of us were around. But, uh, you know, the population of dolphins depends on many factors. Very highly reproductive. Um, a lot of their success in growing past juvenile stage has to do with the available food. So sargasm population being high or, you know, presence of sargasm is good. Bait, you know, I, I, it probably gets deeper into plankton and so many other small forms of food that, you know, make their life cycle successful. Not to mention fishing pressure. You know, the last 10 years, 15 years, there's been more long line pressure on them in the Carolinas. Not saying that they catch big amounts every year, but some years they do and some years they don't. And harvest matters, the recreational sector, of course, catches the lion's share of the population. I think the 20 inch rule has been really helpful. And people learning how to release fish better with deep hookers instead of wrapping a towel around them. You know, if a fish is hooked deep, cut the line. I've seen evidence over the years where fish do dislodge hooks better than we think. So those things all matter. The tuna population, I think, is in really good shape. I've heard reports in recent weeks where blackfin tuna population in Key West is just off the chain. Like some of the shrimp boats have almost entire schools of blackfin. Not like the old days where you'd see nine of them were bonitas and one of them was a blackfin. Right. It's not like that. And the guys venturing offshore in recent weeks, anything outside of 300 feet is busting with blackfin. And, and not just little football. There's been some nicer size fish out in deep water, too. So tunas are a bright spot. You know, wahoo, kingfish. I would say I don't see as many kingfish in Miami as we used to see. But I did see about a month or so ago, six weeks ago, we fished a tournament that was a multi inland tournament, the Sailfish Challenge. And we ended up off the sewer, actually off of Oran Tower, one day, final day of the tournament. And we could not keep baits in the water inside of about 150 feet of water. You know, we have bait tubes, so we got all the baits preloaded. We can get a spread out in less than two minutes, just a bunch of crew, and we fired all the baits out, and within like 60 seconds, we had seven liters flying in the air, <laughs> you know, all chopped off. Of I mean, I, I haven't seen kingfish numbers like that in a long time. And uh, that day, I actually personally hooked a 150-pound yellowfin and added on the leader and ended up breaking the leader on it, but the boat next to us caught an 84 and an 85-pound wahoo. So that was a wow. kind of a magical day. It was 
just more kingfish than you could even dream of and lots of pelagics. We had, I think, three black fins that day. Most of the other boats got several black fins. So, you know, you do see these little flashes of great pelagic numbers, even in, you know, Stewart, where they maybe a week earlier were saying how slow it was. Things move around and the population do shift, but I don't see great concern for kingfish, but I don't see the kingfish population in general outside of that big pool that we experienced. You know, it's the average number of kingfish in the reef. I would say down a little bit. I might have some good news on that, and it's been consistent with us for the last six months at least, and it's the first time in my life I've ever seen it. That's why it stands out. When we get on Vermilion Snapper, we will free line with as little weight as possible on top of the school, and it seems like we always pick off the biggest Vermilions doing that. We've been doing that our whole lives. Over the last three years, I've seen more and more and more 12 to 18-inch kingfish, if you can believe that, that we're catching on cuttlefish and little chunks of ballyhoo or whatever we're cutting up for beeliners. So maybe we've wow. got some strong year classes coming up. That would be great. I hear the same thing up north with the bluefin. You know, there's some big, big numbers of juvenile bluefin. That's a, that's a bright spot. In the last three years, I know you didn't ask for this, but this has certainly been a highlight for South Florida, is the numbers of bluefin seen late February through early April. Mm-hmm. Sorry. We've seen bluefin swimming south on the northeast wind more than one or two days a season. I mean, there there were days this year already where there's probably been 50 bluefin seen by the fleet fishing out of Miami in one day. Really? That guy, that guy saw a pool of five. And on one day, we had all three boats out. And I want to say between our three boats, they saw roughly about 30 bluefin. And then there were other fish seen, you know, in other places. So. That's what I'm getting at. That was the day that I'd say there were at least 50 different fish seen. You've seen some videos online recently of bluefin showing up at strange places, shallow water, and so on. And I'm hopeful that the bluefin population is rebounding. Boy, wouldn't that be something? Wouldn't that be something? What if we had a bluefin fishery out of Miami, Florida? Oh, yeah. Well, you know, the interesting thing, if you fish for them in late May and early June in Cacti, you're, you're really looking for some form of a south wind, you know? southeast to southwest great but that usually happens when there's a low pressure system and, and what a company's low pressure but cloud right and rain so the days when the wind is right visibility is not anytime. <laughs> and you can't but see them yeah fish, right yeah and when we do see them we're on top of them you know and we're pushing them down the neat thing about that late february to early april period in miami is we're catching them there during that migration south in other words we're seeing them swimming south into the gulf to go spawn and then of course in late may early june you're seeing them going north back up to new england and canada so the cool thing about the northeast wind in, in that march time frame is typically that's the day after the front and we got blue skies and when you're looking for them you're going against the grain so if they're swimming south we're in the tuna tower looking for them as we go north, but we have a southern hemisphere sun in February and March and April. So we're running up the edge, you know, at trolling speed, looking for the schools. We got the sun at our back. We got generally blue skies. So for those reasons, I think there's actually a chance that a few boats that are interested in doing it and you get the right anglers and don't mind dedicating some time to it in the middle of the day when you can really see them. I think you're going to see more and more bluefin caught over the next few years. I'd love to see one in my lifetime. Now, let me ask you about three things real quick. The current Mahi regulations, as I understand it, is 10 per person uh, over 20 inches. Is that correct? Correct. Okay. Blackfin tuna have recently gone to two per person. Is that correct? That's right. All right. And Wahoo, I believe, are two per person. Do you feel like those rules are strict enough? Do you feel like we should leave them where they are, or how would you change them? I think it's a great starting point. Unfortunately, it takes time to really reveal you know, the results. It's not something you can base on one or two years of harvest, mainly because of how transient Wahoo are. Wahoo have just been very difficult to you know, catch in any quantity. Yes, you can go to the Bahamas, certain conditions, catch them in quantity, but that doesn't happen here very often. You know, If you catch two or three Wahoo in a day, you've had a great day. And as far as blackfin tuna, not many people were abusing the opportunity on blackfin. You'd see some pictures of a guy with 30 or 40 little footballs or 20 big blackfins in May. But that didn't happen very often. You know, somebody that really went after him with tons of chums in May trying to catch the big ones. So I was never really super concerned. 
concerned about them. And fortunately, you're not talking about something like a snapper or a group that has a narrow region that they inhabit. A black and tuna is so transient and so widespread. That I think it would be very difficult to put a serious dent in. That's always kind of been my thoughts on mahi. If you find a floating board 500 miles from any landmass, guess what? It's got a mahi under it. <laughs> That's the biggest reason that there are still mahi. <laughs> right, right. I believe it. Because we have certainly tried to wipe them out. <laughs> All right. That's fantastic. Listen, I wanted the word from the water, and you sound pretty darn optimistic. I think you think that largely we're doing a good job with our regulations and our some of our yeah. new rules, and I think you agree with me that we need to continue to work to keep the uh, pelagic long lines out of the Straits of Florida. I think it's a good idea. I mean, I'm not an anti-commercial fishing guy, but you know, I've done a fair amount of it in my life in my younger days. I mean, I, I will give them credit. We have the greenest long line fleet, the most eco-friendly long line fleet in the world. We can circle with many, many restrictions. But at the end of the day, still fairly indiscriminate. There is a bycatch involved. So you're dealing with something that's pretty good at catching fish. you got to remember a long line is largely unaffected by 30 knot winds. Right. Um, so once that thing's set, it's catching on all the days when a recreational fisherman stays at home. But again, I'm not here to bash longliners. I think there's some really great, hardworking people. And like I said, they, they do a much better job than the rest of the world's longlining fleet, in my opinion. But Florida Straits are just such a unique place with such a bottleneck. That's the issue. If you look at it from the 20,000 foot view, you're looking at a great volume of water getting compressed through a really what's about a 35 or 40 mile wide bottleneck funnel. So when you can lay lines across that whole length or, or, or most of it, night after night after night, things that swim against the current seeding are going to interact with it. And it's, it's just an area that are very prone to harvest. So right. That's why the Florida Straits and the whole East Coast of Florida are so critical to, you know, making wise conservation decisions. So, you know, it's a tightrope. One group isn't more important than the other, but there certainly are ways that have sustainable fishing, and that's my goal, keeping people on the water, all, all groups, really. I don't disagree with you a bit. I understand exactly what you're saying. Real quick before you go, I want you to tell me the story that you and I were talking about earlier with what happened with the mahi that you captured and what you learned about the breeding habits of mahi. Yeah, the, the guys at the Rosenfield School are really brilliant guys. Ron Honig, John Stieglitz, I helped them catch their broodstock for many years. And they basically told me that keeping them in captivity, you learn so much about their feeding and breeding habits. Females will fawn approximately every other morning 5% of their body weight. They, of course, feed them well in those tanks, but they probably grow at a little higher rate, maybe even a much higher rate than they would in the wild. But one of our money that started out at about 5 pounds in less than 10 months on a digital scale, he got kind of outgrew the tank. They weighed him on a digital scale, 56.4 pounds. Wow, that's incredible. What a growth rate. Yeah, they're very interesting fish. And the other thing that I found interesting, I didn't tell you this, but the mahi actually starts laying eggs, producing viable eggs, at 250 grams, which is a little more than a half a pound. A half a pound mahi is laying eggs. Yeah, which is, which is why having size limits are important. You know, any fish that you can let have a few breeding cycles is wise conservation. Sure. Absolutely. Fascinating fish, no doubt. Ray, thank you so much for your time. Okay. Anytime. Appreciate getting to talk to you. Captain Ray Rocher from Miami, Florida. He has captained more boats and spent more time on the water than just about anybody. He sounded pretty darn optimistic. That's going to wrap up this week's edition of Florida Sportsman Action Spotter Podcast. We wanted to bring you a little something different. We talked with Ellen Peel, who believes that our billfish stocks are coming back, sailfish in particular, since we took the longliners out of the eastern economic zone. But she's scared to death that the government's going to allow them to come back in, and uh, we're going to fight a lot of the problems we did before. You guys know from listening to Nick Stancic every week, we've got a booming swordfish stock going on right now. We need to leave it alone and keep it under regulation, keep it tight. Ray Rocher says there's a lot of good news on the water. He feels like sailfish populations, whereas this year in South Florida wasn't very good because there wasn't much cold weather to drive them down there. The numbers are in great shape, and he said they're having an unprecedented blackfin tuna run right now. So that is certainly great news also. Hey, they were brought to you tonight by Yamaha Reliability Starts Here. 
by Tournament Master Chum, the best chum on earth, by Nassara Paradise Rentals, your dream vacation, and by Young Boats. You want the best in flats, bay, and offshore hybrid boats? You want to visit youngboats.com. Gosh, I enjoyed it. Learned a lot tonight. I hope you did too. I tell you what, if you did, please take the effort to subscribe to our podcast. We're going to be back next week. Who knows what our world's going to be like then, but we'll be back to talk fishing with another edition of Florida Sportsman Action Spotter Podcast. <laughs>